Um, I will talk uh, about quantum ergodicity. That's an old and a new subject together, and it, it's very big. Uh, so I'll be very selective, and maybe because of my own preference, like condensed matter background, I will be concentrating on many body quantum ergodicity. There is a lot of work which was done with heavy nuclei and maybe billiards and things like that. I will just mention those on passing, but I'm not going to, to uh, talk much about them. So uh, this field is interesting. I think it got like sort of a new birth in, in uh, well, after cold atoms. But in particular, there was a uh, very influential uh, paper by Marco Trigo in 2008. And actually, it brought um, uh, on light other papers, uh, and one, two of them by uh, Mark Srednitsky. Uh, uh, they were sort of written in the 90s and sort of forgotten. And I will talk about uh, those as well. So, uh, uh, because there is a lot of numerics, I will. Uh, I decided to rely on slides. I will maybe occasionally uh, use a blackboard. And I know there is always a tendency when you use slides to go faster. So, if you stop me with questions, it will be helpful, I guess, to everyone to flow down. So, I basically thought that maybe I'll split the lectures in in kind of two parts. Uh, so one, I will talk about quantum ergodicity and the eigenstate thermalization hypothesis. Basically, I will throw out the concepts and uh, how they, when they work, when they don't work, and maybe show some examples. Uh, so. And then in the second part, I will try to uh, show how you can use this eigenstate thermalization hypothesis for some statements in equilibrium, non-equilibrium thermodynamics. Again, some of them we know very well. Uh, these are laws of thermodynamics. Some uh, we already know very well. These are fluctuation theorems. But I will also uh, mention them, but mostly uh, in the context of expansion, uh, in a sense that, uh, it will, uh, as was uh, mentioned many times, we have p to the minus beta w average equal to uh, 1, or whatever ratio of partition functions. but uh, these relations are not very useful uh, in big systems un un unless W is small. Because uh, taking something which is uh, very big, extensive, and exponentiating is just useful. So, and there will be many fluctuation relations, so I will talk about connections with fluctuation dissipation relations and so on. So I also want to apologize, I'm still a little bit jet lagged, so I will frequently say wrong words. So. Anyway, I'll try to be as coherent as I can. So let me start from some very, very general statements. So uh, I, again, loosely speaking, I, I, I want to say there are sort of three approaches uh, and various interpolations between them, how we can describe a uh, dynamical system. And even though it's quantum ergodicity, in this talk I will be frequently mixing classical and quantum. I will try to emphasize when quantum mechanics is important. So first is my, it's purely microscopic. So we just write some microscopic equations of motion, say Hamiltonian equations of motion. And in principle, if you know our Hamiltonian, we know everything about the system. So, but as we know, there are lots of things hidden uh, beyond words in principle. So, and in particular, these approaches, they work only for really small Q-particle systems. So even if you have like a, uh, from this cartoon, you can see that if, if our dynamics is chaotic, then very, very small error, which we'll introduce in the beginning, it can be is a numerical error, or error because our Hamiltonian is not purely isolated, or error because we don't know all the coupling constants in the Hamiltonian, or maybe initial conditions are not perfectly known. So any small error will propagate, and soon it will be very, very expensive when in classical systems to follow the trajectory. There are exceptions. And these exceptions are integrable models, those which we like to, to play with a lot. Well, there is another approach, just to start from statistical physics. So we just say that we have 
some partition function, which basically gives us a, a microscopic probability distribution. And after that, we just we are saying, uh, let's use Hamiltonian dynamics, but perturbative. So, and using this perturbation theory around the partition function, we can again make many predictions. And in particular, all the scuba type responses, conductivity and its susceptibility, fluctuation dissipation relations. So, lots and lots of statements were derived in this framework. Well, now people are more interested in more sophisticated approaches where dynamics is partly Hamiltonian because, again, there is a bus, so there's some work on in blood dynamics. But it's basically still a Hamiltonian dynamics where you try to focus only on subsystem and somehow throw out approximately the rest of the system. And there is, I, I, I should say, third type of approaches. It's, it's uh, mixed. It's, it's not fully microscopic, not Hamiltonian. It's not purely statistical in the sense that it doesn't rely on proximity to equilibrium. And we also know this approach is very well. So there are kinetic equations, master equations, Fokker Planck equations. Well, as we've heard, Ginsburg-Landau equations, and so on and so forth. But basically, uh, this amounts to writing some uh, equation uh, for probability distribution, which should satisfy detailed balance, which usually is put by hand. So we know that if, if uh, the system is in equilibrium, then the rodity should be zero. And it's obvious it should satisfy conservation law. Well, if there are additional constraints, like total energy is conserved or whatever, you can also put them back. So in a way, I will, I will, of course, not connect all of them together, but I will show some hints how using uh, uh, newer insights, in particular from this quantum ergodicity, eigenstate stabilization hypothesis, we can sort of see how these approaches are connected. So there is no magic, there is no disconnect between them. Good. Let me just show again one more like basic slide. Uh, so uh, I already just, uh, told you that there is a chaos uh, which makes a problem, but again, uh, a, a problem in, in simulating things microscopically. But again, usually at least when I started at school, we were saying they were this words in principle. In principle, if we can solve, I don't 10 power 50 equations, we could get full information. But let me just try to argue that maybe this in principle is actually fundamentally flawed. So let me imagine that we don't have the universe to begin with. We just start building it, particle by particle. So if you have three particles, we can ask, so can this universe describe itself? And obviously no, because we even cannot store information. So, oh, hmm? Well, how we can store the information. So we want part of the universe to explain another part, basically. And, uh, well, if, if, if you want to describe how the three particles collide, there is nothing left to describe. So let's start adding particles by particles. So if we have 100 particles, we maybe describe the three. Because we will use other three to simulate experiment, simulate the three, and other whatever remaining 94 to store the data. But if we want to simulate with this 100 particles, whole universe of 100 particles, it becomes much, much harder than even with three because we need tremendously more information. Like in quantum language, we need exponentially more information. So now we might think, okay, when we reach 10 power of 50 particles and, and someone I know, gave us a tool like a pen to write equations, did it fundamentally change the situation? I don't think so. If 10 particles, it, you just need to realize that complexity grows much, much faster than any ability to solve problems, to write equations or anything like that, to store the information. So basically, uh, I would say that uh, microscopic approaches, they are very, very useful uh, tools, but they are definitely incomplete. Okay, so how we traditionally connect all the three approaches? Well, in classical uh, mechanics, and I assume there were lectures about this, uh, it's, it's uh, through er ergodic hypothesis, and it's not really always hypothesis, sometimes it's even mathematically proven. And basically, uh, what it tells us, this ergodic ergodicity, well, it tells us that if you wait long periods of time, and now I'm assuming that my Hamiltonian system is Hamiltonian here, and Hamiltonian doesn't change in time. So after long periods of time, 
uh, the time which is spent by ensemble of particles in some region of phase space uh, at the same energy and in principle if there are other constructed integrals what it is like momentum, angular momentum, or maybe something else number of particles, we should also fix them it's just proportional to the volume of this region so in simple words we can say classical uh, ergodicity is complete delocalization in the phase space satisfying the constraints and uh, coming back to this example like ergodic statement will tell me that if I have chaotic cavity then if I look into a uh, long time average of a position of the particle then what I will get is just basically microcanonical ensemble so which is a more fancy way to say that my particle will be uh, will have random direction of momentum and one random coordinate so magnitude of the momentum will be fixed by the one well if you have uh, uh, integrable systems then clearly we have more degrees of freedom and I will be talking uh, about this in detail later but from this picture it's clear that system will still randomize itself but with a constraint phase space so it's not that integrable systems are not ergodic they just have more constraints uh, more constraints and uh, in this example in order to have ergodicity we had to uh, introduce some, typically some irregularity of the cavity uh, but it turns out that most uh, interacting par uh, many particle systems they are chaotic even with regular interaction and this will be uh, my, my uh, main subject of my book. but before going to ergodicity let me just show a very famous example and probably most of you know about it when ergodicity doesn't work and this is like Fermi Pastulam problem uh, I guess it's last uh, paper by Fermi and he actually didn't write it himself he, but, uh, he initiated it uh, in 1954 so they had computer to, to simulate you know, this nuclear reactions but Fermi was a curious person and, and uh, they decided to study ergodicity of thermalization in a one dimensional chain so, and of course everyone knew that if you have harmonic chain that the system will never thermalize because if you want uh, all occupations of normal modes are strictly conserved or classically all energies of normal modes are strictly conserved so what they did, they added nonlinearity and they played with nonlinearity so they added three types of nonlinearity this is a particular one and they even called type 2, uh, 3 or something like that Fermi Pastel model so it's basically quartic nonlinearity and interaction which leads in cubic nonlinearity and equations of motion. And then uh, to avoid fast oscillations, they looked into slow variables. So these are basically our integrals of motion of a non-interacting system. And what they expected to see is that if they, by modern language, they do interaction quench. Actually, I think when Alessandro attributed first quench papers to 2002, Fermi Pastulam problem is actually interaction quench. You start from an interacting chain and suddenly turn on interaction. Maybe, maybe, yes. Yeah. yeah, but it's it's perfect uh, uh, well classical quench problem. So they hope to see ergodicity. So in, if they would observe uh, the, how this energy is behave in time they start in a particular state where only one mode is occupied so it means that all energy is stored in one mode and energy of all other modes is zero and then as time evolves you just see that first things look okay because energy definitely goes down from the first mode and goes up into other modes I believe there are 32 sides here so in principle you should see all the numbers up to 32 but somehow it goes up to 5, maybe just tiny bit to 7 and then stuck. But instead of equipartition when sort of all energies will go to the same line, they go to some crazy regime that basically everything comes back. And you might say, if I wait longer, this is a little bit smaller, then it will go down, 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 but that actually even this is not true. There are super revivals. So eventually this one this revival will go down, 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 but then it will go up, up, up. So if I go uh, uh, to, like, I don't know, 
five or six revivals, I will get almost 100% energy uh, back. So in principle, even in, in equilibrium, it's not surprising to have fluctuations, but not such fluctuations. You expect fluctuations maybe like a few percent. So uh, we see that uh, uh, this system, despite it's nonlinear, and as far as it's known, it's non-integrable, it's still uh, non ergodic Just a question. So in the previous plot, you were plotting those energy variables that you wrote down yes. on the different sides. Uh, this is in momentum space. Yeah, please ask me a question, by the way. Yeah, so when you write on slide, you forget to say. So this is momentum space. So this are at, this are eigen modes of non-interacting system. So you occupy first momentum mode. It just imagine that you are doing something like that. So you have a circular shape, and then you just squeeze it. So you do something like that, and then this thing starts to oscillate like this, and then eventually you expect that this energy will be dissipated into other modes, and this will turn on. In normal systems with a finite entropy, you have these recurrences, right? That any state you start off with, you will be. Right. So you're not in that regime, right? No, so this are exponentially, yes. yes. So those recurrences are exponential. Even in statistical physics, in equilibrium statistical physics, there is a room for very rare fluctuations. And for example, in the previous talk, they were responsible for switching magnetization. So it's not that they're not there, but they're exponentially rare. So here, uh, it, it's not shown in this plot, but what you can show the dynamics are self-similar in the sense that if I keep gradient of the phase constant, initial phase, so this Q means first mode occupied means my momentum is whatever, 2 pi over 32. So if I keep this gradient constant, I go to 64 sides, but now I occupy second mode. I go to 128 sides, I occupy fourth mode. Then dynamics is completely self-similar. So uh, this separation changes with system size, but, but not, not exponential. Yes, it turns out that later, Fermi uh, I guess he thought they were lucky, but actually they were lucky because they, they started really new field. And there is a journal paper in Scientific American by David Campbell and collaborators, which, which title is Fermi Pasta Lam, uh, Problem and, and Birth of Experimental Mathematics, or something like that. So maybe it's a little bit overselling, but definitely it was the beginning of new field. But it's known that if you start at slightly high energy, different initial conditions, or so whatever, the system is fully ergodic. It's still not known whether there is a transition or crossover between the two regions, at least as far as we know. Okay. So, it turns out that uh, for few body, body systems, uh, actually around the same time, uh, uh, people thought about this, and in particular probably heard about kolmogorov Kolmogorov-Arnold Moser theorem, which I'll mention in a second. Uh, so it, it's uh, uh, a situation when we have a uh, uh, few degrees of freedom. So it's n, but n is not a big number. It's maybe 3. So originally, uh, uh, Arnold, well, I guess uh, it was mostly PhD work of Arnold, as far as I understand it. Uh, they were interested in stability of like planet systems, so they were interested in, in few body systems uh, with chaotic behavior. It's slightly, uh, well, this, uh, just they were in interested in the one set of chaos in, in uh, the system. It turns out that this theorem found uh, lots of applications, and probably many of you know Capizza pendulum. So if you take a pendulum and start shaking it, it, it can go upside down and be stable. It's also part of this category, so where you can uh, understand why things are stable from, from uh, the uh, point of view of this uh, KMC. So, but basically, uh, uh, for few body systems, the situation is more or less understood, at least mathematically. So if you have a system with uh, n degrees of freedom and n integrals of motion, uh, these are commutators, but think about them as Poisson brackets. Uh, 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 then uh, it's it, it just known that uh, trajectories, which are confined to constant integrals of motion, are some tori in multidimensional space. 
And then, what was proven mathematically by Kolmogora, Parnold, and Moser, that if you don't have degeneracies between frequencies, so it's basically, think about this, you have radial motion and angular motion. If they are not perfectly degenerate, then uh, uh, it will take you some finite amount of interaction to uh, break down integrability. So otherwise, you'll just slightly modify this tori, but the system will sort of still move in the vicinity. system will become chaotic within, within a tori, but it will go, not, won't go to, to another tori. So classically, it was understood that uh, uh, thermalization or ergodicity or chaos uh, it uh, occurs through destruction of uh, KM tori, uh, and you need finite amount of interactions to to cause uh, 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 ergodicity. Is there an easy estimate of the amount of interaction strength that you need to Yeah, it's just first order perturbation theory. So basically, what you do, you do Fermi Golden Rule, it's for classical system with the same thing, and then you just check that basically uh, a transition matrix element between two resonances is comparable with the lifetime which you get within the same Fermi Golden Rule. So it's, it's a very simple criterion. So does this theorem explain your previous slide that if we don't well, okay. that's exactly it. So there are lots of actual issues with this theorem once you go to thermodynamic limit or once you go to quantum system. Because we know if you think about gas in this room, you barely need nothing to thermalize. Maybe there is something, uh, and very small, but this something should be so small that uh, it's basically zero. So it's something which goes down with the system size. So, and uh, uh, as uh, usually in many body physics, uh, you can make statements precise only when interaction uh, is small compared to some uh, scale which goes down with the system size. So like for example, you can make high temperature pre uh, expansion precise if uh, temperature times energy span of your Hamiltonian is less than one. But in thermodynamic limit, energy span is infinite. So this sort of statement become useless. So you really need to know how to resum sort of your series. And as far as I know, it's, it, it hasn't been done for KM series. But there is a numerical strong numerical evidence that it does work for the fermi problem. Because you can still write this criterion, it's like doing first order perturbation theory. So like doing Fermi-Golden rule. And from the Fermi-Golden rule, estimating when you get a, a chaos. And these were papers by Chirikov, Israelis, and, and well, mostly that. And from uh, those, you can get a criterion, uh, which is an estimate up to three factor. And then there was a numerical study of spectral entropy. It's basically, if you want, it's, it's, it's like a von Neumann entropy uh, uh, where you look into, uh, or Shannon entropy if you want, where you look into occupation of uh, your modes after a long time in the form of Pascal's problem. And then you realize that if the system thermalizes, then this occupation, these are probably energies, not occupations, but energies, because you know in equipartition they will be the same. If the system thermalizes, then these energies will be the same and this entropy will reach maximum value. If on the other hand, uh, everything stays in one mode, then this entropy will be zero. So what you can do, or what uh, these guys did in 85, uh, they looked into long time limit of this entropy as a function of interaction. And uh, they see that uh, there is a critical lens so this, by the way, is an intensive interaction because it's total energy divided by system size. But if you fix energy density, it becomes well-defined in thermodynamic limit. So uh, there is a curve beyond which it seems that the system normalizes. So it's basically, if you want, this regime, the system is non-ergodic, here's what it, it is avoided. So this is an example where it seems that there is an onset of, of ergodicity in thermodynamic limit. Uh, when I spoke to Israelov about this, so uh, the, uh, uh, he is basically the author of this, um, uh, with of they wrote this criterion based on first order perturbation theory. Uh, he mentioned that it looks like in second order perturbation theory, you should destroy any counter, right? 
And the reason is that in first order perturbation theory, you can imagine that it's sort of hard to match if you have sufficiently big separation between frequencies. It's hard to find to match these frequencies within small interaction. If you think about quantum mechanically, within for the golden rule, uh, uh, you cannot. Uh, I mean, you cannot uh, give enough energy because there is finite energy mismatch. You need finite interaction to do it. But if you have many multi-mode uh, resonances, you can always exchange energy. So basically, one mode goes down, another goes up, and there in the system you can always find nearly perfect resonances. So from this point of view, according to him, it seems that at very long times, even in infinitesimal interaction, the thermodynamic limit should destroy everything. But it doesn't happen to me. So this is entropy. So it's basically think about this as, as, as indicator of mode occupation. When it's zero, it means that all modes are occupied. So you have thermal mode. If it's one, it means that only one mode is occupied. Oh, it's here. It's, it's, this en it's normalized entropy. So you just define Shannon entropy spectral entropy if you want, Kolmogorovic. And then uh, look into ratio of, of maximum entropy minus your entropy and maximum entropy minus whatever. So this is entropy as a function of interaction. So interaction increases here. Well, it's, it's here, it's log interaction. These are weird axes, but then curve looks nice. So interaction increases here. So here you have very, very small nonlinearity. And then it's localized. And then you increase, and then uh, it becomes chaotic. So they make the statement that it looks to be right in thermodynamic limit, because you see they look into different system sizes, and everything more or less falls on the same curve. Eta is the inverse temperature? No, eta is entropy. Sorry. Oh, no, beta, beta. Is oh, beta, yes. Uh, no, 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 beta, sorry. Beta is nonlinearity. Yes, that's, oh, that's, that's a bad notation. Sorry. Uh, it will be inverse temperature everywhere in the rest of the talk. Okay. So, the, but it's a standard, standard notation for FPU. So they introduce nonlinearity, they call it beta. E is the total energy you put into the system, and N is the system size. So you keep energy density fixed. So that's why it's, it's well defined thermodynamically. Okay, good. So in summary, the summary of the plot is to make beta large enough, it will thermalize. Yes. Yeah, right. And how do you decide when you evaluate this entropy? So can you say? So this entropy is evaluated as well as long ago. Yeah, they looked into very long time. You're absolutely right. So when we deal with classical systems, there is always a question, did we wait long enough? So I don't know exactly what they did. So they looked long enough time, but whether they looked into times getting longer and longer, in principle, you need to check that if you wait longer, uh, this doesn't change. But they average over very, very long times. So these are extremely long times. So it's still, but that's why it's not a proof. It still might happen that at exponentially long time, the system will thermalize. So it's not a proof. OK. So, but my talk is about uh, quantum organization. Yeah? So let me just uh, set up the language. And this is the language for now. I will talk about Hamiltonian dynamics. In the last part of, of my lectures, I will try to talk about Hamiltonian dynamics, but in, in bigger systems. So when you have two systems, systems and bus. So, but for now, at least for this talk, for sure, uh, I confine myself to the situations when we are start from an isolated quantum system with time-independent Hamiltonian and some arbitrary initial state. So uh, uh, let me introduce first uh, in the setup the density matrix. It's, it's, I, I'm sure like every, every single one here knows what it is and uses it and so on. But yet there are lots and lots of confusions. At least sometimes I, I hear. Uh, People are saying if, if you know, I don't know, uh, uh, your density matrix of your universe, you can uh, measure everything, which is, of course, completely wrong. If you have your density matrix of uh, universe and you have exponentially many copies of the universe, then you can measure it. It makes really big difference. 
But sometimes the difference is not important when we look into many observables, but sometimes it's, it's very important. So, right. so let me assume that we start each experiment from a pure, pure state for now. And this state evolves with some Hamiltonian H. So I can always write this state in the eigenbasis of my Hamiltonian and then evolution is trivial. Then I will be interested in expectation value of some observable, which is, as we know, a, a permission operator. And then, basically what I do, I, I write expectation value, plug it in uh, this expression and find something very simple. So this is, as we know, sum over double sum n m, uh, coefficients cn, star cm, and oscillating exponents, and the matrix. Now, let me say maybe trivial words, but they're very, very confusing, including myself. In order to measure this expectation value, you have to perform many measurements. This measurement, that single measurement doesn't give you expectation value. So, but each measurement corresponds to a new experiment. So, if we were able to start experiments with exactly the same sign on. Then I can say, okay, this is what I measured. But in reality, you'd never start from the same sign on. You start from a different sign. Because the way you prepare the system is, is random. After all, even when we cool cold atom gases, we think about them. Like if you do it, well, Wolgan Catalyst does it in Boston, he connects to Niagara Falls, right? Through electricity grid. So all these fluctuations which are there, they translate to cold atoms. So there is no way you can uh, cool the system to, to a pure eigenstate. Maybe if it's a small system, you can cool it down to a ground state because it's separated by a gap especially. At a finite temperature, no way. So therefore, when we do measurement, when we want to find expectation value, we always do both average over quantum fluctuations, if you want, and statistical fluctuations. So this bar here, and bar will fluctuate from slide to slide, <coughs> but here bar means statistical average of initial noise. And let's call this statistical average as rho and m. This is our density matrix. And then we just see that this density matrix evolves in time, as we all know. So one thing I want to emphasize, that there is a big assumption here that Hamiltonian is not fluctuating. Because you might say, but what if in which uh, experiment I will get different Hamiltonian? Well, that's the simplest way to get the coherence. Usually we say there is some mysterious bus or whatever. But we can say, no, we always have pure evolution. But each time we have slightly different Hamiltonian. One say with subway nearby, one without subway nearby. So this immediately introduces uncertainty in, in my evolution. And this, is, this can be tracked uh, with this Limbladian formalisms and so on, uh, dissipation, yes. So the preferred state, uh, in any experiments, they do uh, send the state to an, uh, a measurement, and then, right. uh, I mean, it will collapse onto an eigenstate. And that in, in, in all those experiments, the state. Yeah, yeah. For few particles, there is no problem, absolutely. Yeah, you can always prepare spins up with very high fidelity. There's no question. But once you go to 10 particles, I, I can ask you, can you prepare, uh, I don't know, system of interacting 10 spins in an eigenstate? Man, it's difficult. Actually, Zion traps, they can almost do now 10. But even this is hard. If I ask you about more complicated systems, no way. Oh, that's coming, yeah. I just want to set uh, uh, the stage. Okay, so density matrix is uh, basically, I want to repeat myself, it uh, includes both statistical and quantum fluctuations. So it has okay, so now let's go to ergodicity. So uh, I, as I said, in classical systems, the statement is very simple. Maybe proof is not, but the statement is simple. You just say in long time limit, your time average of your phase space variable, so x sets for my all possible phase space variables, spin direction, coordinates, momenta, whatever you want, uh, it will be given by microcanonical 
than the average, and therefore any observable will be so. What about quantum systems? Or I should say maybe quantum language. Because again, very often when people refer to quantum ergodicity, they just refer to language of quantum mechanics. You have to be careful which statements are really sensitive to the fact that you're quantum and which is just consequence of the fact that you're using language of quantum mechanics. So in quantum mechanical language, I know that my evolution is trivial. There, is, there are no nonlinearities, it's just usual linear algebra, defacing. So, and because evolution is so trivial, I cannot relax my density matrix, right? So if I look into this time average of the density matrix, I will get, well, something which, is, which, is, which describes me just initial probabilities to occupy eigenstates of the Hamiltonian, but there is no reason for this to become microcanonical density. So it means that thermalization must be hidden in the structure of eigenstates. Because the devil of complexity is somewhere, right? So it's not that they disappeared, but it's just hidden somewhere in the structure of the state. So maybe this coefficient cell. And this was realized very, very long time ago, but for Neumann and then uh, a lot of people uh, explored this stuff. So, but basically what for Neumann originally said that maybe we should look into observables. Density matrix, it's too complicated, it clearly doesn't thermalize. But it doesn't mean that if you look into a particular correlation function, it will not thermalize. So in particular, what we want to understand whether expectation value of some quantity, this can be magnetization, correlation function, or whatever, in the long time limit will be the same as expectation value in some thermal state. And long time limit is usually understood at long times at almost all times. Because of course if, if my average, time average is not representative, if I have flashing back and forth, we won't call it some limit. So, so this is a statement for a closed system, right? Yes. If I'm just looking at a subsystem and then the reduced density matrix kind of course. Yes. 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 Is this only a statement about unitary evolution? Then? This is yes, but thermalization is definitely not. But it's, it's actually the same question because I can always uh, look into subsystem as sort of unitary evolved bigger system. Or I can say it's, it's a non Hamiltonian dynamics for a subsystem. But for now, I will stick to uh, one system, and later I will go to many, I mean, two, not many. So I guess if something thermalizes, we can expect some kind of a temperature. Yes. And uh, is it a guarantee that whatever variables will thermalize, they will give rise to the same temperature? Nothing is guaranteed, but I will show what typically numerics, well, show what numeric uh, show, right? There are no proofs beyond this point. <laughs> I should probably put it in the slide here. Yes. This is your initial density matrix. Yeah. Right, right. So I everything is here. So this, this is actually not C alpha squared. These are averages of C alpha squared over experiments. So whatever is, is your... So you can say, yeah, so you can say maybe I, I always start from a state where these C alphas are already normal. So that's definitely a possibility. But then you will be forced to say that one eigenstate is not enough. Anyway, I'll go through these things uh, in, in uh, detail. So, but in a way, just you see, quantum language thermalization is interesting. So in classical language, we have particles which collide, and because of chaos, they lose memory. In quantum language, everything is built in eigenstates, but, or if you want, these coefficients. But these coefficients, which are probabilities to occupy eigenstates, they don't change in time. That actually means that my thermalization is like opening a blanket. In a way, I already know. So once I did a quench, same, day, same second, my wave function still didn't change. <coughs> but I already know what my infinite time limit. It's just hard to measure. Yes? Are, are you speaking the outside of the Yes, 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 yes. Uh, yes. I mean, in general, that's not... No, I'm projecting to energy against it. 
I, I can expand it in any basis. Right, but they won't necessarily No, no, no. I'm just saying in long time limit, sorry. Oh, maybe I, I skipped the crucial, most crucial step. So, if I average this over time, yeah, I, I missed the main thing. <laughs> sorry. Yeah, so, if I average this over time, then only diagonal elements will survive, right? So, that's the point. So, but basically, diagonal will survive, but will, will not change, right? So, diagonal elements at time equal to zero are the same as at time equal to infinity. So, in some sense, if you work in the right basis, you don't need to wait until the system normalizes to find out its property. Just, you don't know this basis. Okay. Sorry. I'm confused. If you start out with some initial density matrix in a closed system, yes. the, the density matrix just remains the same, right? Even the off diagonal elements. No, magnitudes remain the same, but phases fluctuate. So diagonal elements in the energy basis are the only ones which don't fluctuate. Everything else oscillates. Like simplest example, maybe two by two system. So imagine you pre uh, you prepare in in x basis. So your density matrix is one half, one half, one half, one half, right? So I write this state in the basis of up and down. But then I apply Hamiltonian, which is minus h sigma z. So what happens? Well, I get e to the a i h t here, e to the minus i h t here. After a long time, it becomes diagonal. Actually, by the way, any measurement you can think about this way. Uh, it's something I didn't emphasize, and I mean, people all, always say this measurements or projections to eigenstates, this is sort of uh, things which you need to memorize and take as a postulate in quantum mechanics. But actually, if you think about the measurement, what do you do to measure spin one half? You exactly apply strong field along z direction to separate them, because if there is strong energy separation between them, you can move them up, one to the left, one to the right, or do other things with them. But that's really dephasing in this basis. So any measurement is actually, is actually you can think about this as appropriate projection to diagonal like some. There's no major in, in measurements. And that's, by the way, the question whether do you really look into the object and this is important or, or you don't look, it's completely irrelevant. If you dephase, in a sense, if you cannot, so you apply field for a long time, and this time slightly fluctuates from experiment to experiment. Oh, you just don't know it. Suppose I, I send you spins at random times. Then from your point of view, it's a completely measured system. Doesn't matter whether you look at it or not. Can you say louder? Sorry, I can't. <coughs> Yeah, 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 yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, I'm, I'm very slow, but I'm coming there. OK, so uh, next I want to mention is Berry conjecture. He was apparently a, also one of the first who thought how you can connect quantum ergodicity, classical ergodicity, and this uh, statement about quantum mechanics. And he just postulated, I guess, I actually don't know from which considerations, he just postulated that if you take this particular strange object, psi of x minus small s over 2 and x plus s over 2, and average over energy shell, which contains many, many states, but still uh, uh, this width of the shell vanishes in limit h bar goes to zero. There's no problem in doing that, because number of levels is exponential, while in, so in, even in h bar. So one of h bar, so there's no problem in taking this limit. And he just postulated that this thing is just Fourier transform of microcanonical distribution. So why he postulated this? Well, I don't know exactly, but I can give uh, you my uh, view on this. So because this Fourier transform of this object, this strange object, is nothing by the Wigner function. Probably some of you heard about this. It, it's an object which gives you one-to-one -one map between quantum operators, including density matrix, and classical objects. So this classical object for density matrix is called Wigner function and plays the role of 
quasi probability distribution in a sense not positive. And basically, what uh, Berry said that uh, the Wigner function of a small shell is a microcanonical distribution. So that's a less fancy way of saying the same complicated thing. So what is the normalization factor sigma? Uh, well, this is basically your phase space volume if you want number of states within this energy shell. Well, it depends how you normalize. So, you know, integral over this, over your phase space should be one. So, basically, uh, if, if you write this integral with one instead of Wigner function, well, integrate over x and t, you should get one. So, anyway, it's, it's phase space volume of energy shell. Yeah, that's, that's basically very conjecture is. So very conjecture said that if we take uh, our system and take a shell which is uh, small but still contains many levels, so in the sense that within any classical resolution it looks like zero width, right? It's smaller than h bar. But yet it contains exponentially many levels. So if you do this, what we'll recover that Wigner function is exactly classical microcanonical distribution. That's what she's conjecturing. And then you probably will be surprised that if I calculate, if I use this very conjecture for some weakly interacting particles, like in this room, and I calculate momentum distribution, I will recover uh, uh, Maxwell distribution. And in principle, I could go to a blackboard and give you derivation, but I won't, because you all probably know this very well. Since average of uh, any power of momentum is just given by average over the Wigner function. That's basically the definition of the Wigner function. And uh, my Wigner function is a microcanonical distribution. It means you can open any books in statistical physics and then see how it works. Okay. Is this conjecture for like any Well, very, uh, I like his style a lot. He doesn't pretend to be general. So he always works with few variables, like very curvature, it's particles in space, or very conjecture particles, but makes somehow very general statement. So I guess you should ask him whether he implies it's just for this system or for everything. To me, it's any set of canonical variables. Doesn't matter, as far as I can tell. But you should ask him. Okay, but this was semi-classical limit. What about quantum systems? So now uh, I come back to what I briefly mentioned before. So we prepare the system in some state, then look into long time limit. As I said, we basically average over time. We see that what we get is average with respect to uh, diagonal part of the density matrix. Question? Yeah? Just to follow up on the last one. We would want a chaotic, a quantum chaotic system yes. for this. Right. So it's not just right. That's why I will have to refer to numeric. But it's coming. Yes, yes, of course. If it would be for any Hamiltonian, I would just take uh, right spin one half and prove it in one line and then say, okay, and then it works. It's, it's subtle. Okay. So uh, in typical situations, actually both equilibrium and not, uh, energy is extensive, while energy fluctuations are sub-extensive. So this you can just prove based on locality of the Hamiltonian if you want. Because if you start from a system with some extensive energy, and then do some interaction range, unless these are infinite range interactions, you will always have uh, fluctuations with scale as, as square root of the system size. So it's if you want central limit theorem, because different parts of the system initially uh, don't know much about each other. And after you do a quench, energy is conserved. So there is a very simple proof. So it actually means that if you want to reconstruct thermal equilibrium for any initial state, we only need to say that this matrix elements within some sub-extensive shell are very close to each other. So if this is the case, then apparently there is no contradiction between time average and, and equilibrium because we just take this O and N, whatever matrix element, out of the sum. All of them are the same. And then sum of rows uh, uh, sums to one. 
So we see that long time limit of the observable really doesn't care about initial conditions. Well, we uh, should say any local observable. It's actually sometimes people talk about, again, projections to eigenstates. But for this, I would like to refer to Landau-Lipschitz. And Landau-Lipschitz says that observable is only object which has well-defined quantum classical correspondence. And at the end, that's what we observe. So any local operator is fine. But if you have, again, I don't know, system of 20 spins and 20 sides, ergodic, means interacting, I invite you to write projection as an observable. So projection is not really, I'll talk about this later. But of course, uh, our proof will be challenging because we know there are observables which do not thermalize. So how to exclude them mathematically is a challenge. That's uh, sort of the reason why these are mostly numerical statements, not analytic statements. So, and this paper which I mentioned in the beginning by Marcus Riegel and collaborators, which, which brought a lot of excitement to this field, uh, where they studied some particular non-integrable model, basically it's shown here, where they can find all particles somewhere, at like least here, and then suddenly turn on tunneling, and then they look into momentum distribution. And basically what they see that after some time, uh, their blue curve, which is true dynamics, saturates near microcanonical ensemble. So there is no difference in, in, in their calculation between diagonal ensemble and microcanonical when you just pick one state, eigenstate. And then you see the system relaxes and stays very, very close to the state. If you look into canonical, there is a difference, but it's because finite size effect. You know, in canonical, uh, in systems with finite number of particles, you have to be careful. Uh, so, this is another plot where they look into long time limit of momentum distribution. And again, same story. This is initial, uh, which is very non-thermal. And then if you look into microcanonical and long time limit, they're basically indistinguishable. So canonical is like it. So this was basically a numerical proof uh, of uh, this eigenstate simulation. But actually, as Mark Sridniki like, like to point out, uh, eigenstate simulation a hypothesis is more than that. It's not about diagonal observables only. We might be interested in fluctuations. And if you like fluctuation of an observable in an eigenstate, then it's, it's a very simple exercise to see that this will be sum over all possible eigenstates not equal to n, basically square of OMN. So it's sum of positive numbers. But the sum contains exponentially many terms. So the only way out is that all these off-diagonal elements are very, very small. So diagonal is of the order of equilibrium, which is say extensive. Off-diagonal are exponentially small. And this was ANSAT, which was m made by Mark Sredniki, I believe in 96, that uh, uh, the full structure of many body matrix element for any generic observable should look like this. So this is large expectation value coming with Kronecker delta plus some function which depends on two variables. E is like mean energy, En plus Em over 2, and omega which is energy difference, times e to the minus entropy over 2, so it's square root of density of states if you want, and maybe some fluctuating random variable with variance of the order of one. So this is answer. It's not proven. So, and we expect that uh, this F0, this function, should be slow function of overall energy. That basically where we look in the energy spectrum of eigenstates, again, should not much depend on this energy. But it can be a quite strong uh, function of energy separation. And we know that if we uh, 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 think about this as, as uh, 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 some operator which excites our system, then typically local operators can only excite a little bit. So it means that uh, if energy between N and M becomes very big, they should rapidly decay. Okay. So now, if we look into fluctuations, we see that they at least become finite. 
because now I can write my sum of this O and M squared as an integral of a final energy EM, but it's the same as integrating over omega, right? I'm, I'm saying that my EM will be EN plus omega over 2. This is the definition of omega. So my initial energy EN is fixed. I start from a given eigenstate. So I am integrating over M. It's the same as integrating over omega. There are probably a factor of one half missing, but sorry for this. Then uh, we need to take density of states at energy EN, which is E plus omega over 2. Then this function, square, because it's square of the matrix element, and e to the minus s, and average of sigma squared becomes 1. So, and we see that at least this huge factor, e power s, indeed cancels. And what we get is actually d omega times integral of this f squared times e power b to omega over 2. It looks a little bit asymmetric. And actually, I think I need to ask. There is a recent paper by Marcus Riegel and Finick where they don't have this factor. And I think it's a mistake, or maybe they somehow try to absorb it here. Uh, but I think this factor is very physical. It just tells you that states with energy above n uh, contribute more to your fluctuations, because there are more of them. So beta is the measure of density of states. So we see immediately that in order for the system to, to satisfy, uh, uh, in, in order for the eigenstate to be thermal, we need this function to decay at least faster than exponential. Because otherwise, we can always find temperature where uh, this will diverge. And this function does decay faster than exponentially. And uh, again, it was checked for some models, but we can just see uh, uh, why it happens if we look into non-equal time correlation functions and look into our intu in, in use our intuition. We know that non-equal time correlation functions basically exactly the same object as what I was describing before, but now you have this extra factor EN minus EM of it because O is taken in the Heisenberg picture. Right? So if I want to write If I want to write this expectation value, e to the plus i h t o e to the minus i h t o a state n connected, it's the same as sum over m not equal to n, n e to the i h t e o sorry, e to the minus i h t m m o n but because n am are eigenstates of my Hamiltonian I immediately pick up this uh, factors and then again I go to the integral instead of sum I go to the integral I have to keep in mind I have exponentially many levels so the level resolution is never there I use discrete levels only for convenience I go to an integral and then I recover same result as before but this extra factor e to the minus i omega t but then I, I can ask how this function should behave in order I reproduce typical behavior. And typically, we have exponential behavior. So we exclude glasses and other non ergodic systems. Well, we know that Fourier transform of exponent is Lorentzian. So we just see that in order to have exponential behavior at large times, it means that at small frequencies, we should get, uh, should get this Lorentzian form. Could you and go to the previous slide where the exponential factor came from? Because, because we evaluate, you mean beta omega over 2? It's because my capital omega, which is density of state, is nothing by e power s. I see. Okay. So, and if you expand s at small omega, you get beta. Yes. Well, this was definitely computed for nuclei. And there, uh, by Israelev and Zelevinsky and other uh, people who worked in quantum chaos long before ETH, 
and they indeed confirmed it. Uh, you get uh, what's called Lorentz of right Wigner function at small frequencies, and at long frequencies, at, uh, uh, we expect Gaussian tail. And this is basically comes again from elementary quantum mechanics. We know that at short times, if you want, this is like a Zeno effect. All correlations should decay quadratically. So in Fourier transform quadratically means it starts in a Gaussian way. In Fourier transform of Gaussian is a Gaussian. So it's faster than exponential. So, it's okay. so and uh, since I will talk about fluctuation dissipation relations and everything later, let me just say that in the same um, uh, Srednicki paper in 96 or 99, he shows that using this ansatz for diagonal elements, which was before, you can recover fluctuation dissipation relations and so on. So this ansatz is consistent with uh, what we know in so many ways. So Good. Yeah, it was a guess. But you should see that this guess was confirmed, as I said, by simulations in nuclei and then other systems, small systems. But is it obvious that I mean your correlation function is not obvious that you should get correlation? Of course. Of course. It means that if you go to glassy systems, our answer will be completely different. Okay, so uh, how representative is time average? Well, uh, again, so before I, I, I describe you the answer, uh, let me just say... Uh, okay, let me just say what I want to measure. So I want to ask, how long time average describes my uh, uh, observable at a fixed time? So I have a question. So what if I do many, many measurements with the same density matrix at time t? So I measure at time t, I measure again at time t, I measure again at time t, and do many, many measurements. And I take average of the observable at time t. Then I do the same over a string of times, and now average the same quantity in time. And I want to ask how close these things are together. <coughs> so if uh, uh, my thermalization hypothesis works, then it should be very small. Because we know that once the system thermalizes, it stays in thermal equilibrium. And uh, indeed, it's, it's a very simple computation once we understand what to do. So we basically want to compute average of observable at time t. It means observable with fluctuating exponent, with, with this uh, oscillating exponent, and just diagonal part of the observable. So, and then we want to integrate this over time. So we want to see how representative my uh, 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 expectation value at time t, and we average basically mistake between given time and time average over time. So that's a typical way. So, and then uh, you can just see that if you square this and average over time, so the only way to get non oscillating terms is when either I choose this em is equal to en, but this will be cancelled by this term. Or I will choose one of the m's is equal to, say, p from the other side. I, I have the sum squared, right? So I have four indices, m, n, and say, p, q. And sum over p, q will have exactly the same terms, e, p, e, q. So if we want, you have direct term and exchange term. So, and this exchange term will give me this following thing. It's rho n m times rho m n times rho m n times rho n. If you want, just do this simple exercise, you will see that this is the only term which survives. And this is a good news, because I know that my matrix elements are of the order of e to the minus s over 2. And I know that also trace of density matrix squared is less than 1. So it basically means if I take this maximum value of OMN squared out of the brackets, which is still e to the minus s, the remaining sum converges. And I see that this is very, very small. So it actually means that my uh, uh, expectation value of the observable at long time t, average over all times, is exponentially close to true equilibrium. So it's not just I have thermalization in the sense that time average uh, approaches equilibrium. I have thermalization that uh, I'm at almost all times close to equilibrium. Uh, I have a question. Actually, I got confused in the first equation. Even though you are taking a long 
time average, still the oscillating terms seem to survive. No, but I integrate over time, right? Yeah, so that is like taking a time average, right? No, no, but I'm taking time average of different orders. I compare the first thing. I take quantum average, if you want, or statistical average, over my observable at time t. So this is a fluctuating variable. Then I square it. And then I integrate over time. And I ask whether it's the same as if I first integrate over time and then square. And these two are actually identical up to exponentially small corrections. Yes? Well, this is, of course, relaxation time. Eigenstate synchronization hypothesis does not explain things which were not explained. It just provides you a new language. No, I understand, but here you're averaging over it. So suppose that instead of taking the limit t goes to infinity, if you define it, you want to know. Oh, it's, it's basically over. So you might imagine that uh, if, if uh, uh, my, uh, uh, well, I'm averaging if you want. I'm just removing oscillating terms. And you can imagine that basically if my average time is longer than relaxation time, I have basically zero contribution of all diagonal elements to my observable. So why it happens is another story, but this is, okay, good. Yes. So when you measure it, you just at different times you measure using different experiments. Right? Yes, so if you do it numerically, you just know expectation value from one measurement. If you think about experiment, you have to perform many, many experiments to measure what's the average at time t. No, I'm saying even if you, you want to measure two different times, because it's integral over time. Yes, right? so well, always, yeah. But so if you want to do it two different times, it's not the same experiment. No, no. at each time, you do many experiments. You first fix time t, then you measure your observable many, many, many times. Then you found expectation value of this observable at time t. Then you do the same a different time, different and a starting, different time, starting from, a different from the same density matrix. Yeah. So we are talking about fluctuations <laughs> of average. So you, you have, I don't know, some <coughs> term like that, right? So now, at each point in time, of course, observable will fluctuate. This is just normal because we, we have density matrix, we have measurement noise, whatever. No, my question is, suppose you want to measure there and you want to measure somewhere here. Yeah, but I exactly compare the things. Uh, but you, you'll, for these two measurements, you will start with different initial conditions? Same density. Statistically, they are the same. Yes. But of course, they are different. I, that's why I, I mentioned density matrix. So density matrix tells us that I, I, each time I start from a new initial condition. Mm -hmm. That I understand. But the, I told you, if you make one measurement there, then then you want to go to the I do out. 10 power 6 measurement here, and 10 power 6 measurements here. Then 10 power 6 measurements here, so starting from statistically same state. So is it now 3 into 10 to the 6 experiment you are doing, or 10 to the 6 experiment you are doing? Well, it's 10 to the power 6 times number of time points we are yeah, doing. That's that's so if I measure in 100 points, it will be 10 power 6 times 100. That's your initial condition. That many initial conditions. Yes. Yes. I need that many. Uh, it's not something you typically measure in experiments, even though when you talk about quantum information or whatever you are, you are more interested no, in No, the reason I am asking that if I, if I do this in classical system, I'll just do 10 to the power 6 initial conditions, uh, even if I have to measure it. Even well, classically, it's the same story. You have statistical fluctuations, so yeah, it means you, it's the same question. So I'm asking, so suppose I started my experiment and in five minutes I decided to figure out what's the average of my magnetization. If I have to suppose to measure at 5 minutes, 10 minutes, and 15 minutes, yes. I can start with the same 10 to the power 6 initial conditions, measure uh, 10 to the uh, yes. 5 minutes, again, right. go measure at 10, to, uh, yes. 10 minutes, and measure at right. 15 minutes, right? Yes. In quantum system, am I doing the same thing? When I go to yes. measure at 5 minutes, I just measure, and then evolve the system from there? No, no, it, no, 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 it's different experiment. Classically, it indeed does matter. If I do a measurement, That's I can yeah. continue. Yeah. Here you have measurement noise. This I'm excluded. If you will have measurement noise, you will have much bigger fluctuations. So if I have to measure three points, it will be three to 10 to the 6 initial conditions. Yes. So each, each measurement is really new experiment.
Okay, I still have some time. So now let me uh, go a little bit closer to, to chaos. So how we can think about quantum chaos, or how people think about quantum chaos? Well, they just say, well, let's imagine that our Hamiltonian is actually random. And let's see what comes out from this hypothesis. So there is a huge literature on this, and I'm not going to cover it. I, I just want to say that uh, uh, one of the main results, at least main for me, is that you recover from this assumption that your Hamiltonian is just random matrix, you recover a very specific prediction that statistics of levels or level separation, it's normalized to mean, has a peculiar, it's called Wigner Dyson form. What is S? S is level separation. It's normalized to one. So it's, it's distance between nearby levels. And then uh, this is completely different from what you expect for uh, non-interacting level. So random matrices and random energy levels are completely different stories. If you have random energy levels, you expect just Poisson statistics. It's like basically throwing a coin many, many times and just look into distribution between spacings. But because points are completely independent, you'll get Poisson statistics. Here you get something interesting. You get much faster tail. It's Gaussian, not exponential. But also you get repulsion at smaller. So this you can derive basically this or nearly this distribution for two by two systems. It's a simple exercise. But let me just show that we intuitively know why this happens, why there is level repulsion. So let's imagine that we have two energy levels which cross at particular point. So it means that in this basis, my uh, density matrix will be degenerate. It will be E1, 0, 0, E1 something. Oh, sorry, not density matrix. My Hamiltonian will be degenerate. It's E1, E1, 0, 0. But now you, you imagine that any, any small noise in all diagonal elements will immediately shift this degenerate. So if I have independent energy levels, I have to require just this, these guys are close to each other. But if I have full uh, matrix, which is random, I also require that these two guys are close to zero. They actually require more. And it's harder to satisfy both requirements. That's why I have level repulsion. Can you give some intuitive idea why well, because it's too much fine-tuning, right? So you have random numbers here. I'm just saying, if you have only random numbers along diagonal, then you just say, OK, these random numbers are close to each other. That's exactly what Poisson statistics. But here, you require that both these are close to each other and also these are close to each other. So it's a stronger requirement. And actually, this Wigner Dyson statistics was checked in many, many contexts. So, uh, this is what I mentioned, uh, people studied heavy nuclei. So, these are some uh, heavy elements, I even don't remember which ones. And this is statistics of 1,726 level spacing. And this is actual data from a long time ago. This is a Poisson statistics for reference, and this is Wigner Dyson. And you see that it works quite well. So just to be sure, so this is just the probability distribution of the spectrum of a random Hamiltonian drawn from this? Well, this is actual, this is random Hamiltonian, yeah. and this is actual data. Yeah. So, and you just see they agree very well. You have a colleague on chaotic random and random matrix. Does the colleague chaotic uh, has a uh, also figure in the Vigna Dyson? No, you just see that levels behave as if the matrix is fully chaotic. You know it's not fully chaotic. Because nuclei are described by well-known forces. Well, it's still complicated. Well, there is a much simpler system. It's a Sinai billiard. So if you know, it's a very simple object. You have a square well and a hole in between. Two by two. So it, this is, it turns out to be a classically chaotic system. And you can just ask, what's the statistics of high energy uh, levels. And amazingly, you recover the same result. So even though it's, it's just single particle Schrodinger equation, once you analyze it levels, you'll see Wigner-Dyson statistics. 
there some kind of universality in this? Yeah. This is pretty universal. No, I mean, like in terms of critical phenomena, something like that. Let me go a little bit further. I'll show you three more examples, and then we will guess if there is a universality. Okay, this is another example from 80s. Hydrogen in a strong magnetic field. Well, we know hydrogen is a simple atom, which we study in undergraduate quantum mechanics. But if you put it in a strong magnetic field, it becomes very complicated. And if magnetic field is very strong, well, I guess by now we are not surprised that it's weak magnetic field. This is experiment. Okay, so now about universality. This is histogram of spacings between bus times arrivals in Mexico. So if this is universality, it should cover this problem as well. So this is data. And this is Wigner Dyson. Interesting paper. Uh, if you know, please don't answer the question. If you don't know, Please, uh, I just ask you, does anyone have a guess why there is level repulsion, time repulsion? I just, uh, I mean, if, if you go to Germany, won't happen like this, right? or Switzerland, <laughs> you'll have a delta function. <laughs> so you have to go to some other country. But in Mexico, I'm sure, like here as well, and maybe in Italy, I don't know. <laughs> you, you can check. Well, at least in certain parts. These are private buses. Maybe this will help. <laughs> So what's the reason for repulsion? They were more percenters. Huh? They want more percenters. So if they see that there's a bus going, they just wait. Yeah, exactly. Because if there is a bus in, right in front of you, you just want to wait a little bit to get some passengers because you don't want to, 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 to go empty. So it's precisely the reason. And amazingly, uh, this reasoning just leads to this universal so prediction. Buses, so public buses are the top. I don't know data for public buses, but I assume that public buses, especially in Switzerland, will be precise delta function. <laughs> well, in Italy, it will be probably Gaussian, right? <laughs> 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 well, in Russia, for sure, it will be Gaussian. It's very broad distribution. Good, but for this one, I even don't have any intuition. This is spacings of billion zeros of the Riemann zeta function. Riemann zeta function is an interesting object. It's connected to, to prime numbers. But why it has such a perfect Wigner-Dyson distribution of zeros? I have no clue. What's the x-axis there? Hmm? What's the x-axis? Which is What's the x-axis of the country? This, is, this one? Yeah, x-axis. It's a zero. Oh. That's a good question. <laughs> well, I mean, apparently this is, well, this is uh, normalized spacing. Apparently this data is taken at very, very large numbers. No, this is normalized spacing between zeros. Normalized on the mean. You go to, to very, very high numbers where I guess this mean was well defined. I don't know details about this one. So these are zeros around Yeah, but they only have uh, zeros in all dimensions. That's the fact about human zeta function. So let me uh, uh, just maybe uh, wrap up slowly. That uh, I mean, I, I showed you this nice picture. Maybe to answering your question, is there universality? Unlikely, because I'm now going to many by the quantum systems, and whether the, if, if if they would be uh, related to to buses in Mexico, I would be very much surprised. Who knows? Maybe things are much simpler. And I talked actually about classical systems in, in many examples. Some of them. So, uh, well, let's take many by quantum system. And this is like a particular one dimensional system of particle bosons with next nearest neighbor interactions and popping. This model was used a lot by various people, in particular, this, this I'm taking from Marcus Riegel and Leo Santos work. And uh, the nice thing that you can tune integrability by changing T prime and V prime. And this is like a, a, a snapshot, whatever, a bunch of snapshots, um, of what happens with statistics of many body energy levels uh, as a function of T prime, which is basically a parameter which breaks integrability, which, if you want, makes you more and more important. 
And you see, originally, the system is completely integrable. It's not ergodic. And I'll talk more about integral systems later. But as you crank up this number, you just see that level statistics becomes more and more weak this. And what they check, that if you correlate uh, where statistics becomes Wigner Dyson and where you see thermalization in terms of observable, the correlations are nearly perfect. You cannot say for sure because these are crossovers, there's no thermodynamic limit, system size are small, but at least from the data it looks that uh, these things, the so onset of ergodicity is the same as onset of randomization. There is even a, a nicer, well, nicer, I would say, more surprising example. It's also from the work of Dea Santos. So if you take same, uh, well, it's almost the same. Hardcore bosons, they are like interacting spins. I don't want to go into details. So they take basically integrable spin chain and add just one impurity. So they have, if you want, 18 spins and take one local impurity. And it turns out that if you put this impurity in the edge, it's like changing boundary condition. It doesn't change integrability. So the system is still integrable. But if you put it in the middle, you break integrability. And it turns out that you just see when it's on the edge, you have perfect Poisson statistics of levels. When you put it in the middle, you have weak effects. It's amazing that one impurity completely changes uh, statistics of levels. So this example is without impurities. No, no, no. This parameter breaks integrability, but this is we want global parameter. So it's like second nearest neighbor hopping. So here it's just local in space. So it's just to illustrate. Uh, okay. I think I'll finish with this slide, maybe just to set the stage for, for uh, tomorrow. So uh, um, I just told you that you can understand quantum ergodicity as a property of eigenstates. Then I told you that this may be a property of the spectrum of the homophonium. But classically, we know that ergodicity implies delocalization. So tomorrow, I will uh, try to convince you that, well, this in the beginning of tomorrow lecture, I'll try to convince you that in a way we can think about quantum ergodicity as also uh, uh, delocalization. And uh, there is a, a very, very simple example, my, I guess, favorite example of non-integrable system. It's precisely a, a system which Leticia mentioned, uh, as non-interacting eigenspins. Well, it's actually even simpler because they're non-interacting. So these are basically arrows which point either up and down. And I know my dynamics is very simple. Each spin is conserved. Very simple integrable dynamics. But we ask uh, a question. So what if we take some typical state with fixed magnetization? Well, actually we know from standard statistical mechanics that this state will look perfectly so. That's actually how we derive, if you want, uh, normal distribution and give distribution for spins. The integrability is not important at all. But now, okay, let me skip this. Now let me imagine the following. So let me do a local quench. The local quench means I take some spins in the middle, take them, and just flip them. So you just see what I did. I took the spins in the box and change red to blue. And if I didn't mess up, it should be exactly like a mirror image. Well, and we know that this is atypical. It's not so. And with my simple dynamics that each spin is conserved, it will never thermalize. So actually, thermalization should mean that this state should sort of delocalize among eigenstates of the homophone. And so, as I will start tomorrow, we can think about ergodicity as a delocalization in the global space. In this sense, quantum ergodicity is not that different from that. Okay, I guess I stop here. Is there any more questions? <coughs> Could you go back to the
to the slide where you derived the formula for delta O square in terms of this integral over x square? Yes. Is that previous? Yes, the previous. Yeah. So maybe okay, yeah. yeah, okay. So in this the delta O squared is not suppressed thermodynamically, right? So which is suppressed? Delta O squared. Oh it is what do you mean it's suppressed? I mean it is o? it is suppressed because of this factor, p to the minus s over two, but it's enhanced because they have many states. Right. So overall in the final expression it's not suppressed by an entropy factor. Yeah, and it should not, because we know that fluctuations should be uh, extensive. It shouldn't they shouldn't be exponentially small or exponentially large. So basically, this fact just more or less fixes entropy dependence. Uh, what remains open is how this function behaves. So this function, as I argued, is basically Fourier transform of your non-equal time correlation functions. So if you have very slow correlation functions like power law, this function will have singularities and maybe very similar to what Alessandra said, like Fermi H singularities and so on. So when I was saying this function is Lorenzo and Gaussian, I was talking about typical situations when you decay exponential. But some of the intuition that we have for large system is that if I measure the pressure or some other thermodynamic variable in a system, it should be sort of very fine-tuned to its average, right? So in some sense, even the these, this, this fluctuation at any given time should be small. Right, but it will be small as one over, no, this fluctuation, if this is extensive variable, then yeah. these fluctuations will be extensive. It's actually already seen here because all fluctuations are connected correlation functions. And connected correlation functions are always uh, extensive, if you want. Uh, you can just see it because uh, even in, in simple classical systems, when you have uh, connected correlation functions, you subtract basically mean squared. And well, think about a high temperature expansion in Ising model, right? So you have e to the minus whatever beta h and you do high temperature expansion. Connected correlation functions are only those which have the same point. If you do Feynman diagrams, you also have all these connected correlation functions. So connected basically means extensive. So it means that the whole thing for extensive observable will be proportional to the volume. But then if you take square root, it will be square root of volume as, as normal. But these things are, are OK. So besides the uh, chaotic versus integrable, are you aware of any other properties of the dynamical system that we can tell just by looking at the statistics of the eigenvalues? Uh, whether it's a unique indicator, or I don't understand the question. So experimentally, you cannot look into statistics of eigenvalues. You just really look into observables. Right, right. But Remember? theoretically, if you, you're saying that I can look at the, the, from the statistics of the eigenvalues and say, oh, this is, um, this is chaotic. Yeah. Well, there were no counterexamples as far as I know. Because in, in principle, you can imagine that what if my eigenvalues uh, have big Dyson statistics, but they're so close to each other, they're exponentially close to each other, then none of the uh, reasonable time scales is sensitive to them, right? Because when I said that we are average over time, of course I cheated. Because if my energy levels, I have like, you know, 100 particles, my so le uh, uh, level separation is 1 over 2 power 100. So in order to complete the average, I have to wait for time much longer than time of the universe. So of course this was cheating. So, but then I can say, okay, maybe it's not important because there are off-diagonal elements of nearby states. They are always zero. I cannot excite these states because they're so similar. Otherwise, they would repel each other. So maybe it's not important. So, and um, maybe I just, I, I'm exciting uh, only high energy states. So can you take that? Uh, in the Fermi pasta Ulam problem at small beta, the level spacing does not satisfy the Wigner Dyson distribution. You mean quantum Fermi Ulam? <coughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, just a second, so let me finish it. So, and then you can imagine that um, uh, maybe, even though this nearby levels of Wigner Dyson, when I go to relevant time scales, I will see something which is completely regular. It doesn't happen numerically, and I don't know why. So answering your question, uh, 
don't know, by energy levels you mean let's how do you define that? You, you talk about quantum Fermi power, yeah. Pascal Lam? Yeah, let's take that interaction and write it on a finite lattice with some level spacing. So that will have some big Hamiltonian <coughs> which you can look at the level spacing of. And then I don't think it has been done because the problem is that Fermi Pascal Lam is a tricky problem. You have many continuous degrees of freedom. So it's not a problem which you can easily discretize. So what you can do, you can write both, I mean, you, even for one particle, you have already infinite Hilbert space. Well, you may be cut to cut it off, but it's cute. And then you have many particles. So normally we like to work with discrete models. It just turns out that uh, there is a model which becomes very similar to Fermi Pascal Lam. It's both Hubbard model. Because both, if you want, just couple Josephson junctions. So couple Josephson junctions, you have interaction energy which is n squared and tunneling which is cosine of gradient phi. And if you and regime when vertices are not important, so gradients are small, you do your expansion up to gradient phi to the force, and you exactly get uh, this problem. But again, so the problem is that you need to go to very high feeling factors. And at high feeling factors, you can use DMRG, you can use some methods, but they didn't, don't give you access to energy levels. So it's, it's, it's very tricky. But my guess is that you're right. They won't be given uh, license. Also, could you go to the next slide? Yes. Oh, sorry, uh, the, the one with the time average. This one? Right, yeah. yeah. So, here you're not comparing the mean squared, the delta O squared at different times, just the average of O at different times. No, I average O squared over the average. So again, what I'm doing, I start my experiment, and this is some, actually it's some sort of cartoon because quantum system doesn't even have one curve, right? If you measure the project system, but anyway, so it's some cartoon of experiment. Then I go here and I measure my average. Then in a separate set of experiments, I go here and again measure my average. And measure average again. And then I compare this average. I'm asking how this average will fluctuate. Yeah, yeah. And this average will not fluctuate, basically. So you're not sort of taking into account the fluctuations of the operator at each of those? Yeah, but those are there already. Yeah, so yeah. Those, those are sort of non those will be standard statistical fluctuations. But because, you see, if I know that my time average is the same as, uh, as uh, typical time, and I also know that time average is the same as statistical ensemble, that's what I was basically trying to show you then I know that uh, my observable here behaves exactly a statistical yeah. example. So by doing this sort of small yeah. steps, I, I, I find so what I want. This direction was the one that you had on your previous slide, the expression that you had on your previous slide, the delta O squared. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So yeah, yeah, th this is the normal average if you want. Yeah. And now I just said that this normal average, whatever, which was there, so this normal average is representative yeah. of, of one step. Not vanishing, not diverging. If you don't make this ansatz, if you don't make this ansatz, you will get here exponentially big number because you see you have exponentially many terms. There is no way you can get finite answer without this ansatz. Uh, so, uh, how does that relate? I mean, does the integrability or lack of integrability of Of course, and this. I will talk about this tomorrow. Right, right, right. It's very important. It, it plays huge role. Right? Uh, so when you compare this level statistics, it is like a Dyson. So here only you look at the level spacing. Uh, what about the, like, uh, uh, semi-circle is a little bit fast, uh, hard because um, you have to choose some window because your density of states, overall density of states changes. I'm not aware, if Alessandro knows, if anyone did come. In principle, it's doable. The problem is that you have a finite number of states and they're spread over many energies. But when you do these calculations, you always have the trouble that you have to, so essentially, the density of states of your many body system is not a constant. Right. As in the, 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 as in the,
So in order to get these curves, what you have to do is first a trick that is called unfolding. So you essentially have to rescale all your level spacing, renormalizing the density of space in order to make it. Then once you make, once you do this, then you compute the level statistics. Right. And you get this quite kind of curves. But if but you don't do unfolding and you just uh, compute straightforwardly your spectrum and, and the level statistics, you will never get this nice curves. But also, I think you have to be careful because it's known, for example, from I don't know, Anderson utilization and this type of problems. You have Wigner Dyson statistics only within levels which are within the Stowell's shell. Yeah, yeah. Outside, you have Poisson statistics. Oh, so that's, the, that's true. And that's also you have to be really careful. So I think if you want to check this, what you have to do, you have to choose window where uh, density of state doesn't change. And you have to be window which is smaller than inverse relaxation time. So that basically this sets the scale. And within this window, I think you will recover semicircle well, loss. always tricky because you have small systems. Right, so but the number of levels is 2,000 or 3,000. If you reduce the window, you reduce already to 200. Mm -hmm. And actually, it might be even less, so it's 100. And then, so I, I don't know. Sometimes what you do is you choose, the you choose the central third of your spectrum. So you have a few thousand levels. You choose the central third, so you have 1,000. And then you, you do this unfolding procedure to rescale out the, the, the variations in the center states, and then you get this. So re uh, unfolding when you just subtract some average? You have, to, you have to take into account that the density of states is changing with, with energy. So you cannot just straightforward the average. And that's what also they do for Riemann zeta zeros? No, that, no? Is, uh, that is a different story. Riemann zeta zeros. I mean, when you do. So they are going I'm to telling you what's, what I actually don't know what it is, semicircle for, for many But it must be the case, right? I mean, if, you, if you see such a perfect statistic, it's hard to imagine it comes from something else. Because, you know, the, the thing is, in random metrics, you have this semicircle distribution, which is practically, you know, close to the center. It's, it's, it's close to flat. So then if you go to the tails, then this, you know, all these nice level spacing, etc., are complicated. You have tracing middle tails and all sorts of operations. So you, you want to go to something. You understand there cannot be semicircle, right? Because it, it, if you don't do various things, because you have a bunch of levels here, a bunch of levels here, a bunch of levels here. But, but just, uh, at the end, if it's a subject of mean, uh, maybe, yeah, but you have to take into levels which really repel each other, but not because you have a bunch bunches of levels which don't talk to each other. Okay, let's head here.